Sylvia Marie Likens was a teenager who was tortured and murdered by her caregiver Gertrude Banachevsky, Gertrude's children, and many of their neighborhood friends. This abuse lasted for three months before Sylvia died from her severe injuries and malnourishment on October 26, 1965 in Indianapolis, Indiana. Sylvia was neglected, belittled, sexually humiliated, beaten, starved, lacerated, burned, and dehydrated by Gertrude and her accomplices. Through intimidation and threat, her younger sister Jenny was forced to participate in this awful crime. The official cause of Sylvia's death was determined to be a homicide caused by a combination of subdural hematoma and shock, complicated by severe malnutrition. Gertrude Banaszewski, her oldest daughter Paula, her son John, and two neighborhood youths, Coy Hubbard and Richard Hobbs, were all tried and convicted in May 1966 of neglecting, torturing, and murdering Sylvia. After eight hours of deliberation, the jury found Gertrude guilty of first-degree murder. She was sentenced to life imprisonment, but released on parole in 1985. Paula was found guilty of second-degree murder and was released in 1972. Hobbs, Hubbard, and John were found guilty of manslaughter and served less than only two years in the Indiana Reformatory before being granted parole on February 27, 1968. The torture and murder of Sylvia Likens is widely regarded by Indiana citizens as the worst crime ever committed in their state and has been described by a senior investigator in the Indianapolis Police Department as the most sadistic case he had ever investigated in the 35 years he served with the Indianapolis Police. Sylvia was the third of five children, born to carnival workers Lester Likens and his wife Elizabeth Betty Francis. She was born between two sets of fraternal twins, Daniel and Diana, and Benny and Jenny. Jenny suffered from polio, causing one of her legs to be weaker than the other. She was afflicted with a notable limp and had to wear a steel brace on one leg. Lester and Elizabeth's marriage was unstable. They often sold candy, beer, and soda at carnival stands around Indiana through the summer, moving frequently and going through financial troubles. Their sons would travel with them regularly in order to assist with their job, but Sylvia and Jenny were discouraged from doing the same, out of concern for their safety and education. As a result, both sisters frequently stayed with their relatives, often with their grandmother. Sylvia earned money by babysitting, running errands, or doing ironing chores for her friends and neighbors, often giving her mother part of her earnings. Sylvia was described as a friendly, confident, and lively girl with long wavy light brown hair and was given the nickname Cookie by her friends. She also loved music, mainly the Beatles, and was notably protective of her more, quote, timid and insecure younger sister, Jenny. On several occasions, the two sisters would visit a local skating rink where Sylvia would help Jenny skate by holding her hand while Jenny skated on her unaffected foot. Gertrude Nadine Banaszewski was born in Indianapolis, Indiana to Hugh Marcus Van Fossen Sr. and Molly Myrtle. Banachevsky was the third of six children and her family was working class. When she was 10 years old, Gertrude saw her father die from a heart attack. Six years later, she dropped out of high school at age 16 to marry her first husband, 18-year-old John Stefan Banachevsky, with who she had four children with. John had a volatile temper and would beat on his wife, but the two would stay together for 10 years prior to their first divorce. Gertrude found herself in another marriage with Edward Guthrie that lasted only three months before these two divorced. Shortly after, Gertrude remarried the first husband, John, with who she had two more children. The couple divorced for the second time in 1963. Weeks after her third divorce, Gertrude began a relationship with a 20-year-old welder named Dennis Lee Wright, who also physically abused her. They had one child together, Dennis Wright Jr. Shortly after the birth of their son in May 1964, Dennis Sr. abandoned Gertrude. By 1965, she lived alone with their seven children, Paula, age 17, Stephanie, age 15, John, age 12, Marie, age 11, Shirley, age 10, James, eight years old, and Dennis Wright Jr., only one. Gertrude has been described, and I quote, 
as a haggard, underweight, asthmatic chain smoker suffering from clinical depression due to the stress of three failed marriages, a failed relationship, and a recent miscarriage. She occasionally performed odd jobs for neighbors and acquaintances, such as sewing or cleaning, in order to earn money. By June 1965, Sylvia and Jenny Likens resided with their parents in Indianapolis. On July 3rd, their mother was arrested and jailed for shoplifting. Shortly after, Lester Likens arranged for his daughters to board with Gertrude. The sisters had recently become close with Gertrude's two daughters, Paula and Stephanie, while studying at Arsenal Technical High School. At the time of his boarding agreement, Gertrude assured Lester that she would take care of his daughters until his return as if they were her own children. Shortly after July 4th, the sisters moved into 3850 East New York Street in order for their father and later their mother to travel to the East Coast with the carnival, with the understanding that Gertrude would receive weekly boarding fees of $20 to care for their daughters until they returned to collect Sylvia and Jenny in November of that year. During the initial weeks in which Sylvia and Jenny were at the Banachevsky household, the sisters were subjected to very little discipline or abuse. Sylvia regularly sang along to pop records with Stephanie. The sisters also attended Sunday school with the Banachevsky children. Although Lester Likens had agreed to pay Gertrude $20 a week in exchange for the care of his daughters, after two weeks, these payments failed to consistently arrive upon these prearranged dates occasionally arriving one or two days late. In response, Gertrude began taking out her frustration on the Lycan sisters by beating them with various tools. For example, a one quarter inch thick paddle. Gertrude began making statements such as, well, I took care of you two little bitches for a week for nothing. On one occasion in late August, both girls were beaten approximately 15 times on the back with the paddle after Paula had accused the sisters of eating too much food at a church supper the household children had attended. By mid-August, Gertrude began to focus the abuse almost exclusively on Sylvia, with her main motivation likely being jealousy of the girl's youth, appearance, respectability, and potential. According to trial testimony, this abuse was initially inflicted upon Sylvia after she and Jenny had returned to the Banachevsky residence from Arsenal Technical High School, as well as on the weekends. This abuse included subjecting Sylvia to beatings and starvation, forcing her to eat leftovers and spoiled food out of garbage cans. On another occasion, in late August, Sylvia was subjected to humiliation when she claimed to have a boyfriend in Long Beach, whom she had met in the spring of 1965 when her family lived in California. In response, Gertrude asked if Sylvia had ever done anything with a boy, to which Sylvia, unsure of her meaning, replied, I guess so. Continuing the conversation with Jenny and Stephanie, Sylvia mentioned that she had once laid under the covers with her boyfriend. Upon hearing this, Gertrude asked, why did you do that, Sylvia? Sylvia replies, I don't know, and shrugged. Several days later, Gertrude returned to the subject with Sylvia, telling her, You're certainly getting big in the stomach, Sylvia. It looks like you're going to have a baby. Sylvia thought Gertrude was kidding with her and said, Yeah, it sure is getting big. I'm just going to have to go on a diet. Gertrude then informed Sylvia and the other girls in the house that whenever they did something with the boy, they would be sure to have a baby. She then kicked Sylvia in the genitals. Paula, herself three months pregnant and also jealous of Sylvia's physical appearance, then participated in attacking Sylvia, knocking her off her chair and onto the kitchen floor, shouting, you ain't fit to sit in a chair. On another occasion, as the family ate dinner, Gertrude, Paula, and a neighborhood boy named Randy Lepper force-fed Sylvia a hot dog overloaded with condiments. Sylvia threw up as a result and was later forced to consume what she had regurgitated. In what was Sylvia's only act of retaliation, she is alleged to have spread a rumor at Arsenal Technical High School that Stephanie and Paula were prostitutes because she was upset with the household singling her out for similar accusations. While at school, Stephanie was propositioned by a boy who told her that Sylvia had started this rumor about her. Upon returning home that day, Stephanie questioned Sylvia about the rumor and she admitted to starting it. Stephanie punched Sylvia in response, Sylvia apologized to her in tears, and Stephanie then also began to cry. 
However, when Stephanie's boyfriend, 15-year-old Coy Randolph Hubbard, heard of the rumor, he brutally attacked Sylvia, slapping her, banging her head against the wall, and flipping her backwards onto the floor. When Gertrude found out, she used a paddle to beat Sylvia. On another occasion, Paula beat Sylvia's face with such force that she broke her own wrist, having focused the blows on Sylvia's teeth and eyes. Later, Paula used a cast on her wrist to further beat Sylvia. Gertrude would repeatedly falsely accuse Sylvia of being promiscuous and of engaging in prostitution, ranting about the filthiness of prostitution and women in general. Gertrude would later occasionally force Jenny to strike her own sister, beating Jenny if she did not comply. Coy Hubbard and many of his classmates frequently visited the Banachevsky residence to both physically and verbally torture Sylvia, often collaborating with Banachevsky's children and Gertrude herself. With Gertrude's encouragement, these neighborhood children routinely beat Sylvia, lacerating her body, burning her skin with lit cigarettes in excess of a hundred times, sometimes using her as a practice dummy in violent judo sessions, and severely injuring her genitals. To quote-unquote entertain Gertrude and her teenage accomplices, Sylvia was forced at one point to strip naked in the family living room and masturbate with a glass Pepsi Cola bottle in their presence, with Gertrude stating to all present that this act of humiliation was for Sylvia to prove to Jenny what kind of girl you are. Gertrude eventually forbade Sylvia from attending school after she confessed to having stolen a gym suit from the school due to Gertrude having refused to purchase the clothing for her. For this act of theft, Gertrude whipped Sylvia with the three-inch wide police belt. Gertrude then switched the conversation to the evils of premarital sex before repeatedly kicking Sylvia in the genitals as Stephanie rallied to Sylvia's defense, shouting she didn't do anything. Gertrude proceeded to burn Sylvia's fingertips with matches before further whipping her. A few days later, Gertrude repeatedly whipped Jenny with the police belt after she reportedly stole a single tennis shoe from the school to wear on her strong foot. Jenny and Sylvia were fearful of notifying either family members or adults at their school of the increasing incidents of abuse and neglect they were going through, as both were afraid that doing so would only worsen their situation. Jenny, in particular, struggled against the urge to notify family members and she had been threatened by Gertrude that she would herself be abused and tortured to the same degree as her sister if she did so. Jenny was also being bullied by other girls in the neighborhood in addition to being ridiculed or beaten whenever she alluded to Sylvia's situation. In July and August, both Lester and Elizabeth Likens would occasionally return to Indianapolis to visit their daughters whenever their travel schedule afforded them the opportunity. The last time Lester and Elizabeth paid a visit to their daughters was on October 5th. On this occasion, neither girl exhibited any visible sign of distress about their mistreatment to their parents. This was likely because they were both in the presence of Gertrude and the children. Almost immediately after Lester and Elizabeth had left the Banachevsky household on the final visit, Gertrude turned to face Sylvia and stated, What are you going to do now, Sylvia, now that they're gone? On one occasion in September, the girls encountered their older sister Diana Shoemaker at a local park. Both Jenny and Sylvia informed Diana about the abuse they were enduring at the hands of their caregiver, adding that Sylvia was being specifically targeted for physical abuse and almost always for things she had neither said or done. Neither sister mentioned the actual address where they resided, and initially Diana believed her sisters must have been exaggerating their claims. Several weeks prior, Sylvia and Jenny encountered Diana in the same park, while in the company of 11-year-old Marie Banachevsky, and Sylvia had been given a sandwich to eat when she mentioned to her sister that she was hungry. Sylvia remained silent about the matter, but Marie revealed this fact to the Banachevsky family in late September. In response, Gertrude accused Sylvia of engaging in gluttony before she and Paula choked and bludgeoned her. The pair then subjected Sylvia to a scalding bath in order to cleanse her of her sin, with Gertrude grabbing Sylvia's hair and repeatedly banging her head against the bath to revive her whenever she fainted. Shortly after this incident, 
the father of a neighborhood boy named Michael John Monroe phoned Arsenal Technical High School to anonymously report that a girl with open sores across her entire body was living at the Banachevsky household. As Sylvia had not attended school for several days, a school nurse paid a visit to East New York Street to investigate these claims. Gertrude claimed to the nurse that Sylvia had run away from her home the previous week and that she was unaware of her actual whereabouts, adding that Sylvia was out of control and that her open sores were a result of refusing to maintain personal hygiene. Gertrude further claimed that Sylvia was a bad influence on both her children and her own sister. The school made no further investigations. The immediate neighbors of the Banachevsky family were a middle-aged couple named Raymond and Phyllis Vermillion. Both initially viewed Gertrude as an ideal caregiver for the Lycan sisters, and both had visited the Banachevsky residence on two occasions while the girls were under Gertrude's care. However, the Vermillions witnessed Paula physically abusing Sylvia, who on both occasions had a black eye, and openly boasted about her mistreatment of Sylvia to them. Upon their second visit to the Banachevsky household, both observed Sylvia to appear extremely meek and somewhat zombified in nature. Nevertheless, the Vermillions never reported Sylvia's evident mistreatment to the authorities. Around October 1st, Diana Shoemaker discovered that her sisters were at the Banachevsky residence. She visited the property in an attempt to initiate regular contact. Gertrude, however, refused to allow Diana entry to the property stating that she had received permission from the parents to not allow either of the girls to see her. She then ordered Diana to leave the property. Around two weeks later, Diana encountered Jenny by chance, close to the home, and asked about Sylvia's well-being. She was informed, I can't tell you or I'll get into trouble. Due to the increase in brutality of the torture Sylvia was subjected to, she gradually became incontinent. She was denied any access to the bathroom, being forced to wet herself. As a form of punishment for her incontinence, on October 6th, Gertrude threw Sylvia into the basement and tied her up. Here, she was often kept naked, rarely fed, and frequently deprived of water. Occasionally, she was tied to the railing of the basement stairs, with her feet barely touching the ground. In the weeks prior to locking Sylvia in the family basement, Gertrude had increasingly abused and tormented her. She would occasionally falsely claim to the children in her household that either she, herself, or one of them had been receiving direct insults from Sylvia in the hope that this would provoke them into attacking her. On one occasion, Gertrude held a knife to Sylvia and challenged her to fight me back, to which Sylvia replied she did not know how to fight. In response, Gertrude inflicted a wound to Sylvia's leg. Neighborhood children were also charged five cents apiece to see the display of Sylvia's body and to humiliate, beat, scald, burn, and ultimately mutilate her. Throughout Sylvia's captivity in the basement, Gertrude frequently, with the assistance of her children and other neighborhood children, restrained and gagged Sylvia before placing her in a bathtub filled with scalding water and proceeding to rub salt into her wounds. On one occasion, Gertrude and her 12-year-old son, John Jr., rubbed urine and feces from Gertrude's one-year-old son's diaper into Sylvia's mouth before giving her a cup half-filled with water and stating the water was all she would receive for the remainder of the day. On October 22nd, John Jr. tormented Sylvia by allowing her to eat a bowl of soup with her fingers and then quickly taking away the bowl when Sylvia, suffering from extreme malnutrition, attempted to eat the food. Gertrude eventually allowed Sylvia to sleep upstairs on the condition that she learned not to wet herself. That night, Sylvia whispered to Jenny to secretly give her a glass of water before falling asleep. The following morning, Gertrude discovered that Sylvia had urinated on herself. As a punishment, Sylvia was forced to insert an empty glass Coca-Cola bottle into her vagina in the presence of the Banachevsky children before Gertrude ordered her into the basement. Shortly after, Gertrude shouted for Sylvia to return to the kitchen, then ordered her to strip naked before yelling to her, you have branded my daughters, now I am going to brand you. Gertrude began carving the words, I'm a prostitute and proud of it, onto Sylvia's abdomen with a heated needle. When Gertrude was unable to finish the branding, she instructed one of the neighborhood children present, 14-year-old Richard Dean Hobbs, 
to finish etching the words into her flesh as Gertrude took Jenny to a nearby grocery store. And what Hobbes would later insist were short light etchings, he continued to brand the text into Sylvia's abdomen. Both Hobbes and 10-year-old Shirley then led Sylvia into the basement where each proceeded to use an anchor bolt in the attempt to burn the letter S beneath Sylvia's left breast. Although they applied one section of the loop backwards and this deep burn scar would resemble the number three. Gertrude later taunted Sylvia by claiming she would never be able to marry due to the words carved on her stomach. Stating, Sylvia, what are you going to do now? You can't get married now. What are you going to do? Crying, Sylvia replied, I guess there's nothing I can do. Later that day, Sylvia was forced to display the carving to neighborhood children, with Gertrude claiming she had received the inscription at a sex party. That night, Sylvia confided to her sister, Jenny, I know you don't want me to die, but I'm going to die. I can tell it. The following day, Gertrude woke Sylvia, then forced her to write a letter as she dictated the contents, which were intended to mislead her parents into believing Sylvia had run away from the Banachevsky residence. The content of this letter was intended to frame a group of anonymous local boys for extensively abusing and mutilating Sylvia after she had initially agreed to engage in sexual relations with them before they had inflicted the extreme abuse and torture upon her body. After Sylvia had written this letter, Gertrude finished formulating her plan to have John Jr. and Jenny blindfold Sylvia, then take her to a nearby wooded area known as Jimmy's Forest and leave her there to die. After she had finished writing the letter, Sylvia was then again tied to the stair railing and offered crackers to eat, although she refused them, saying, give it to the dog, I don't want it. Gertrude forced the crackers into Sylvia's mouth before she and John Jr. beat her. On October 25th, Sylvia attempted to escape from the basement after overhearing a conversation between Gertrude and John Jr. pertaining to the family's plan to abandon her to die. She attempted to flee to the front door, However, due to extensive injuries and general weakness, Gertrude caught her before she could escape the property. Sylvia was then given crackers to eat, but was unable to consume the food due to extreme state of dehydration. Gertrude forced the crackers into her mouth before repeatedly striking her face with the curtain rod until sections of the instrument were bent into right angles. Coy Hubbard then took the curtain rod from Gertrude and struck Sylvia one further time, rendering her unconscious. That evening, Sylvia desperately attempted to alert neighbors by screaming for help and hitting the walls of the basement with a spade. One immediate neighbor of the Banachevskys would later inform police she had heard the desperate commotion and that she had identified the source as coming from the basement of 3850 East New York Street. But as the noise had suddenly ceased at approximately 3 a.m., she decided not to inform police about the disturbance. By the morning of October 26th, Sylvia was unable to either speak coherently or correctly coordinate the movement of her limbs. Gertrude moved her into the kitchen and having propped her back against the wall, attempted to feed her a donut and a glass of milk. Gertrude threw Sylvia to the floor in frustration when she was unable to correctly move the glass of milk to her lips. Sylvia was then returned to the basement. Shortly after, Sylvia became delirious. When Paula asked her to recite the English alphabet, Sylvia was unable to recite anything beyond the first four letters or to raise herself off the ground. Paula verbally threatened her to either stand up or she would inflict a long jump upon her. Gertrude then ordered Sylvia, who had defecated, to clean herself. That afternoon, several of Sylvia's other tormentors gathered in the basement. Sylvia moved her arms with an attempt to point at the faces of the tormentors she could recognize, making statements such as, You're Ricky and you're Gertie before Gertrude would shout, shut up, you know who I am. Sylvia unsuccessfully tried to bite into a rotten pear she had been given to eat, stating she could feel the looseness in her teeth. In the attempt to wash Sylvia, a laughing John Jr. sprayed her with the garden hose brought to the house that afternoon by Randy Lepper at Gertrude's request. Sylvia, again, desperately attempted to exit the basement, but collapsed before she could reach the stairs. In response to this effort, Gertrude stomped on Sylvia's head before standing and staring at her for several moments. Shortly after 5.30 p.m., Richard Hobbs returned to the Banachevsky household and immediately proceeded to the basement. He slipped on the wet basement stairs and fell heavily to the floor of the basement to be confronted with the sight of Stephanie 
crying and cuddling Sylvia's lacerated body after she had been ordered by her mother to clean her. Stephanie and Richard then decided to give Sylvia a warm soapy bath and dress her in new clothes. They then laid her upon a mattress in one of the bedrooms as Sylvia muttered her final wish that her dad was here and that Stephanie would take her home. When Stephanie realized that Sylvia was not breathing, she attempted to apply mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation as Gertrude repeatedly shouted to the children in the house that Sylvia was faking her death. Sylvia Likens was 16 years old when she finally succumbed to her injuries. Gertrude beat Sylvia's corpse with a book, shouting, Faker, Faker! However, she soon panicked and instructed Richard Hobbs to call the police from a nearby payphone. When police arrived at her address at approximately 6.30 p.m., Gertrude led the officers to Sylvia's body lying on a mattress in the bedroom before handing them the letter that she had forced Sylvia to write previously. Gertrude also claimed she had been doctoring Sylvia for an hour or more prior to her death, having applied rubbing alcohol to Sylvia's wounds in a futile attempt at first aid before she had died. She added that Sylvia had earlier run away from her home with several teenage boys before returning to her house earlier that afternoon, bare-chested and clutching the note. Clutching a Bible, Paula Banachewski having stated to all present in the household that Sylvia's death was meant to happen, then looked in Jenny's direction and calmly stated, if you want to live with us, Jenny, we'll treat you like our own sister. As previously instructed by Gertrude, Jenny recited the rehearsed version of events leading to Sylvia's death to police before whispering to the officers, you get me out of here and I'll tell you everything. The formal statement provided by Jenny prompted officers to arrest Gertrude, Paula, Stephanie, and John Jr. on suspicion of Sylvia's murder within hours of the discovery of her body. The same day, Coy Hubbard and Richard Hobbs were also arrested and charged with the same offenses. The three eldest Banachevsky children, plus Coy Hubbard, were placed in the custody of a nearby juvenile detention center. The younger Banachevsky children and Richard Hobbs were detained at the Indianapolis Children's Guardian's home. All were held without bail, pending trial. Initially, Gertrude denied any involvement in Sylvia's death, although by October 22nd, she had confessed to having known the kids, particularly her daughter Paula and Coy Hubbard, had physically and emotionally abused Sylvia, stating Paula did most of the damage and Coy Hubbard did a lot of the beating. Gertrude further admitted to having forced the girl to sleep in the basement on approximately three occasions when she had wet the bed. She became evasive when one officer stated the likely reasons Sylvia had become incontinent were her mental distress and injury to her kidneys. Lacking any remorse, Paula signed a statement admitting to having repeatedly beaten Sylvia about the backside with her mother's police belt, once breaking her wrist on Sylvia's jaw and inflicting other acts of brutality, including pushing her down the stairs into the basement two or three times and inflicting a black eye. John Jr. admitted to having spanked Sylvia on one occasion, adding that most of the time I used my fist to abuse her. He admitted to having burned Sylvia with matches on several occasions, adding that his mother had repeatedly burned a child with cigarettes. Five other neighborhood children who had participated in the abuse, Michael Monroe, Randy Lepper, Darlene McGuire, Judy Duke, and Anna Sisko, had also been arrested by October 29th. All were charged with causing injury to a person and each were released into the custody of their parents under subpoena to appear as witnesses at the upcoming trial. The autopsy of Sylvia's body revealed she had suffered 150 separate wounds across her entire body in addition to being extremely emaciated at the time of her death. Her injuries included burns, severe bruising, and extensive muscle and nerve damage. Her vaginal cavity was almost swollen shut. All of her fingernails were broken backwards, and most of the external layers of skin upon Sylvia's face, breasts, neck, and right knee had peeled or receded. In her death throes, Sylvia had evidently bitten through her lips, partially severing sections of them from her face. The official cause of Sylvia's death was listed by coroner Dr. Arthur Kebble as a subdural hematoma due to her receiving severe blow to her right temple. Both the shock she had primarily suffered due to the severe and prolonged damage inflicted to her skin and subcutaneous tissues, plus the severe malnutrition, 
were listed as contributory factors to her death. Rigor mortis had fully developed at the time of the discovery of her body, indicating Sylvia may have been deceased for up to eight hours before she was found. Although Dr. Kebble did note Sylvia had been recently bathed, possibly after death, and that this act could have hastened the loss of body temperature and thus sped the onset of rigor mortis. The funeral service for Sylvia Likens was conducted at the Russell and Hitch Funeral Home in Lebanon on the afternoon of October 29th. The service was officiated by the Reverend Louis Gibson with more than 100 mourners in attendance. Sylvia's great casket remained open throughout the ceremony with the portrait of her taken prior to July 1965 adorning her coffin. The trial of Gertrude, her children Paula and John, Richard Hobbs, and Coy Hubbard began on April 18, 1966. All were tried together before Judge Rabb at Indianapolis's City County Building. The attorneys for Richard, Coy, Paula, and John Jr. claimed they had been pressured into participating in Sylvia's torment, abuse, and torture by Gertrude. Gertrude herself pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. The trial of the five defendants lasted 17 days before the jury retired to consider its verdict. On May 19, 1966, after deliberating for eight hours, the panel of eight men and four women found Gertrude Banachevsky guilty of first-degree murder, recommending a sentence of life imprisonment. Paula was found guilty of second-degree murder, and Hobbs, Hubbard, and John Jr. were found guilty of manslaughter. Upon hearing Judge Rabb pronounce the verdicts, Gertrude and her children burst into tears and attempted to console each other as Hobbs and Hubbard remained impassive. On May 25th, Gertrude and Paula Banachevsky were formally sentenced to life imprisonment. The same day, Richard Hobbs, Coy Hubbard, and John Banachevsky each received sentences of 2 to 21 years to be served in the Indiana Reformatory. In September 1970, the Indiana Supreme Court reversed the convictions of Gertrude and Paula on the basis that Judge Rabb had denied repeatedly submitted motions by their defense counsel at their original trial for both a change of venue and separate trials. Gertrude and Paula were both retried in 1971. Paula opted to plead guilty to voluntary manslaughter rather than face a retrial. She was sentenced to serve a term of between 2 and 20 years imprisonment for her part in Sylvia's abuse and death. Despite twice unsuccessfully having attempted to escape from prison in 1971, she was released in December 1972. Gertrude Banachevsky, however, was again convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Over the course of the following 14 years, Gertrude became known as a model prisoner at the Indiana Woman's Prison. She worked in a prison sewing shop and was known as somewhat of a quote-unquote den mother to younger female inmates. By the time of Gertrude's ultimate parole in 1985, she had changed her name to Nadine Van Fossen, a combination of her middle name and maiden. Within her parole hearing, Banachevsky stated her wish that Sylvia's death could be undone, although she minimized her responsibility for any of her actions, stating, I'm not sure what role I had in Sylvia's death because I was on drugs. I never really knew her. I take full responsibility for whatever happened to Sylvia. Taking Gertrude's good conduct in prison into account, the parole board marginally voted in favor of granting her parole. She was released from prison on December 4, 1985. Following her 1985 release from prison, Gertrude relocated to Iowa. She never accepted full responsibility for Sylvia's prolonged torment and death. She primarily blamed her actions upon the medication she had been described to treat her asthma. Gertrude lived in relative obscurity in Laurel, Iowa until her death due to lung cancer on June 16, 1990. After her 1972 parole, Paula Banachevsky assumed a new identity. She worked as an aide to a school counselor for 14 years in Conrad, Iowa, having changed her name to Paula Pace and concealing the truth regarding her criminal history when applying for the position. She was fired in 2012 when the school discovered her true identity. Paula married and had two children, the baby daughter to whom she had given birth while waiting trial in 1966 and whom she named after her mother was later adopted. The murder charges initially filed against Gertrude's second eldest daughter, 15-year-old Stephanie, 
were ultimately dropped after she agreed to turn state's evidence against the other defendants. Stephanie also assumed a new name and became a school teacher. She later married and had several children. She was last known to have resided in Florida. Shortly after their mother's arrest, the Marion County Department of Public Welfare placed Marie, Shirley, and James Banachewski in the care of separate foster families. The surname of all three children were legally changed to Blake in the late 1960s after their father regained their custody. Marie died of natural causes on June 8, 2017. Dennis Lee Wright Jr. was later adopted and died on February 5, 2012 at the age of 47. Richard Hobbs, Coy Hubbard, and John Jr. all served less than two years in the Indiana Reformatory before being granted parole on February 27, 1968. Richard Hobbs died of lung cancer on January 2, 1972, at the age of 21. Following his 1968 release from the reformatory, Coy Hubbard remained in Indiana and never attempted to change his name. Throughout his adult life, Hubbard was repeatedly imprisoned for various criminal offenses, on one occasion being charged with the 1977 murders of two young men. Shortly after the January 2007 premiere of the crime drama film in American Crime, Hubbard was fired from his job. He died of a heart attack in Shelbyville, Indiana on June 23rd of that year at the age of 56. John Jr. lived in relative obscurity as well, under the alias John Blake. Several decades after his release from the Indiana Reformatory, John Jr. issued a statement in which he acknowledged the fact he and his co-defendants should have been sentenced to a more severe term of punishment. Prior to his death, John Jr. had also occasionally spoken publicly about his past, readily admitting he had enjoyed the attention Sylvia's murder brought upon him and also claiming to have only ever hit Sylvia once. The injury to person charges brought against the other juveniles known to have actively physically, mentally, and emotionally tormented Sylvia, Anna Ruth Sisko, Judy Darlene Duke, Michael John Monroe, Darlene McGuire, and Randy Lepper were later dropped. Anna Sisko died on October 23, 1996, Randy Lepper, who had visibly smirked as he testified to having hit Sylvia on up to 40 separate occasions, died at the age of 56 on November 14, 2010. Sylvia's sister Jenny later married an Indianapolis native named Leonard Wade. The couple had two children, although she remained traumatized by the abuse she had been forced to watch her sister endure. Jenny died of a heart attack on June 23, 2004, at the age of 54, in Beach Grove, Indiana. Fourteen years before her own death, Jenny had viewed Gertrude's obituary in a newspaper. She clipped the section from the newspaper, then mailed it to her mother with a note attached, saying, Some good news. Damn old Gertrude died. Ha ha ha. I am happy about that. Elizabeth and Lester Likens died in 1998 and 2013. In the years prior to her own death, Jenny had repeatedly emphasized that no blame should be attributed to either of her parents for placing her and Sylvia in the care of Gertrude, as all her parents done was be naive with Gertrude's trust and promise to care for the sisters until their return to Indiana. The house at 3850 East New York Street in which Sylvia had been tortured and murdered stood vacant for many years after her death and the arrest of her tormentors. Although discussions were held about the possibility of purchasing and rehabilitating the house and converting the property into a woman's shelter, the necessary funds to complete this project were never raised. The house itself was demolished on April 23, 2009. This site is now a church parking lot. The overall case of Sylvia has been portrayed in media, both in film and television. The 2007 film An American Crime is directly based upon the life and murder of Sylvia. The film is not an easy sit-through, but I do recommend to watch it at least once in your lifetime. The Girl Next Door is another 2007 film loosely based on the murder of Sylvia. In conclusion, this story is dark, disturbing, and sick. And someone as sweet as Sylvia Likens did not deserve the horrific situation thrown at her. And that's my piece. Thank you.